the diseases that affect us today are primarily ones of slow accumulation, which are often brought on and or exacerbated by stress, unhealthy habits, and environmental toxins. Thus, what we do and what we experience on a daily basis has both short-term and long-term impacts on our physical and mental well-being, and ultimately, really, lifespan. In fact, it's the job of the brain and the body to adapt to environmental impacts and environmental inputs. Further, humans both shape and are shaped by the environment. So given this relationship, it's conceivable that we can design deliberately the built environment to both induce and habituate specific behaviors and specific physical functions in order to mitigate various degenerative diseases. In fact, <clears throat> the way in which we habituate behaviors and the, the way in which we habituate physical functions is through repetition. So buildings become the ideal point of intervention through which medicine can be designed. Additionally, every organ system in your body reacts in relation to in the environment. It functions in relation to the environment, which makes architecture really a way to design a more holistic medicine that addresses your whole body and every system in it that is currently available through modern pharmacology. So a process through which you can follow to produce these types of buildings is as follows. You first start off through case studies and clinical trials, researching materials whose physical properties can affect the underlying systems and organ systems that produce symptomatologies and various diseases. Next, you can configure these materials into spatial organizations that both habituate and induce specific behaviors in their users, and you shape these spatial organizations into a form that both influences and interacts with the user. So I've included here a couple experimental buildings that I've designed, as well as a couple pieces of technologies from synthetic biology that I've reappropriated for my uses here. So the first one is the sandbox house. Uh, this house is designed in order to mitigate the effects of aging. Uh, there are various symptoms that I've, that I've identified as being able to be influenced by the built environment. Uh, the first one of which is the degeneration of the vertebral column. So this causes slouching, uh, the upper spine is often painful, it's often hard to walk. Uh, the next symptom is bone degeneration, which often leads to falling. It can lead to osteoporosis. If you fall, you often break something. And this, in fact, is one of the biggest fears of people aging in place, is falling and breaking something. Uh, the next symptom is a loss of your vestibular functionality. Your vestibular system in the brain is your sense of balance. So since your brain and your body are both use it or lose it mechanisms, if you slouch over, if you use external crutches to balance yourself, if you look down while you walk, these all signal to your brain that you're not gonna use your sense of balance so much because you have external crutches, which means it will eventually deteriorate, deteriorate in its functionality and you will have an increased likelihood of falling and breaking something. And the last symptom is sleeplessness. Uh, you get less sleep and less slow wave sleep efficiency as you get older, which has impacts as far reaching as memory, attention span, as well as cardiovascular fitness and health. And finally, that leads to uh, longer, wider, thicker, and stiffer veins, cardiovascular arteries, uh, that often get built up and can lead to heart attack. Uh, so the First materiological response that I have come up with here, uh, one more, there you go, uh, is to replace the floor with fine grain sand. Fine grain sand creates a moving, a shifting, soft condition to which your sense of balance has to constantly adjust. So you walk on sand and it moves underneath your feet, which means you need to constantly calibrate the ways in which you can balance your body on this moving mechanism. Furthermore, if you fall on sand, you're not going to break anything. No one's going to break a hip from falling on sand. Uh, sand also takes 4.3 times, on average, more physiological energy to walk on. So just from, by moving from space to space in your house, you are getting aerobic exercise, which have impacts as far reaching as cognition, memory, attention, as well as cardiovascular fitness.
The next materiological response that I came up with uh, is based on research from NASA. So NASA uses these vibrating metal plates and they make their astronauts stand on them for 10 to 20 minutes per day after they come back from space having been in zero gravity. You don't use your muscular attention as much to balance yourself. Your bones are gonna deteriorate and you're gonna lose a lot of bone mass. So standing on a metal plate for 10 to 20 minutes per day has been shown to restore a lot of the bone mass that astronauts lose in space. So I reason that you spend about 10 to 20 minutes per day in your shower, so I replace the floor of the shower in this house that you can see there with a vibrating metal plate that is between 70, uh, sorry, between 28 to 30 hertz uh, per second in its vibrations. Furthermore, um, your slow wave sleep cycles operate at 12 hertz per, se per second. Your fast wave sleep cycles are 14 hertz per second. You wanna be in your slow wave sleep cycle more during your sleep to maximize the amount of benefits that you get from sleeping. So I've designed a bed module, uh, one before, <laughs> one slide before, there you go. So I've designed a bed module built into the house that's built on top of a vibrating metal plate that's vibrating at 12 hertz per second that will hopefully be able to extenuate or extend your slow wave sleep cycles. Uh, the next experimental uh, proposition that I'm making in terms of medicine is based on a technique developed by a company called Biomason in North Carolina. And Biomason has found a way to combine bacteria and sand to make bricks. They propose this as a sustainable initiative because you're not taking natural resources out of the earth, you're creating your own, sand is replenishable, and um, this will change the building industry, really. I propose, however, utilizing a byproduct of bacteria that's derived from the cell walls of gram-negative bacteria called lipopolysaccharides, and this type of product, bacterial product, is found in farm populations uh, primarily where the animals are. And they've done studies now that show that children exposed to these bacterial products uh, are many times less likely to develop hay fever, asthma, and sensitivity to allergies. In short, or simply, it's exposing you to more varieties of bacteria, in particular this one, at an early age allows your immune system to distinguish better between your own cells and those of an intruder, like an allergen or a virus. If you can identify these viruses earlier, your immune system can attack them better and earlier and stop their propagation throughout your system. So I propose replacing the bacteria that they're currently using in uh, the biomason bricks with these endotoxins, these lipopolysaccharide uh, bacteria that produce these lipopolysaccharides, uh, making a baby room out of that because you're in a baby room from about the time you're born until you're five years old, which is the ideal amount of time to be exposed to these bacteria for long-term effects, and using these bricks to construct the material of the room. Uh, so next house that I've, or the next building that I've designed is a cognitive remediation school to manage autistic children in the classroom and to remediate their symptoms through the functionality and materials used. So the first classroom on the lower level in the next slide, or the first, first symptom that I'm addressing in autistic children is a lack of eye contact. So autistic children have an aversion to, not a disability, but an aversion to eye contact in social situations. The next symptom is uh, unresponsiveness to verbal cues or facial information. So autistic children tend not to look at people when they're talking, uh, they tend to face away. Um, the, uh, autism is a spectrum, so obviously not all autistic children display these symptoms, but in particular I can affect this through the built environment. The next symptom is overstimulation, the resting heart rate of an autistic child in response to the same stimulus that a typically developing child experiences can be up to twice as much with no indication on the face or in the body. So you can have twice as high a heart, heart rate in response to like air conditioning or touching. Uh, the next symptom is uh, unresponsiveness to traditional teaching methods. So I've created a classroom that turns the teacher into an interface through which information is both disseminated and given to. Um, teachers stand in these glass rooms in front of a camera and parts of their body 
and parts of their face are magnified and displayed on these screens to which autistic children follow and get the information from. So by decontextualizing this facial and body information and putting it onto a screen, my hypothesis is that this makes it less threatening to autistic children, it decontextualizes it, and hopefully the effect will be that they are desensitized to these visual stimuli when they're in a social situation. And hopefully this will allow them to get more information from what the teacher is saying. Additionally, point source speakers are scattered throughout the space, each of which can be modified and modulated based on what you want to train in each child, the individual needs of each child in relation to the space in which they're in the room. So if you want to train visual processing more than auditory processing, you lower the speakers so that you have to listen harder to the speakers while following along with the face. The auditory percept is not complete. If you want to train auditory processing over visual, you make the speakers louder in, a, in their point source, so you can make it in a particular area in the room, and you dim down the screen. If you want to train sensory integration, you make both at an equal level, or you make them asynchronous, and that will train both auditory and visual integration in terms of information processing. Uh, the, <clears throat> the children will have laptops to which, into which they will input answers to the teacher's questions, and the, the teacher will receive real-time feedback for how well each child is internalizing the information based on the spatial location in the room, and you can move children around based on their individual needs and how they best process information. The next room that I've designed is the upper level to this school. It's an anechoic, partial anechoic classroom. So anechoic chambers are typically used to test the sound of jet engines, um, sound equipment to make sure that they're not too loud for humans to hear. Uh, the spatial, the geometric configuration of these foam wedges in a space when done correctly and effectively, can make the interior decibel level minus nine, which anecdotally is um, soft enough for you to be able to hear your own blood coursing through your veins. And sound can also travel up to one foot in these spaces, in complete anechoic chambers. Making a partial anechoic chamber so that the students can hear what the teacher is saying. Uh, will drown out the sound coming from other students in the room, as well as air conditioning, as well as sound coming from the outside, addressing the symptom of overstimulation in autistic children in response to environmental stimuli. So it will calm them down, it will allow them to have a safer and more relaxing environment in which to learn. And finally, in conclusion, this, uh, this way of thinking tends to get a lot of attraction because it's novel, because I'm the only one doing it. It's new, it's innovative. That's not my concern. My concern is its efficacy and its usage. Innovation is generally seen as a fad in today's technological economy when things are presented to you at such a fast rate and technologies change so quickly. The new technologies that come out, the innovations that occur, are typically sh seen as short-term products or fads that will, be, that will propagate through culture and will eventually disappear. My, my wish is that this is going to be seen as medicine rather than a piece of innovation and it will spur lifestyle changes and be able to remediate a lot of the degenerative diseases that affect today's world.